similar thing. Um, we've talked about this. I think we did this one time at a mentor class way back. I think there was a presentation that was, and it's basically because I had a conversation today with somebody that brought it up again. And I was thinking this may be a good, good topic to cover is talking about in particularly scraping versus API. Now this isn't as much of a, probably not as much a technical thing, although I guess it is to some extent because I, I, I think too often that particularly when you're getting started, you'll, you know, when you're not, when you haven't done a lot as a developer, you'll hear, you know, somebody will say, hey, we need to scrape this data. And then you just say, okay, well, it's on a website. We've got to go to that website. We've got to find a way to crawl it and pull that because because that's a cool, fun, challenging thing to do. Or because I just did that in my, you know, my software class a couple of years ago. So I sort of know how to do it. And it is one of those things like once you know how to do it, it's like, cool, I can do it. It's slow, it's tedious, it's painful, depending on how well they use IDs and whether you have to use CSS selectors or XPath and all that kind of crud. But it's also so fragile. And even with, um, there's some AI projects that are working on that to try to make that less fragile. But even with that, APIs are so much better. And there's just like, even the idea of like importing and exporting data, like just file uploads and you know that kind of stuff that's, they are ways to integrate and to move data from system to system that I think people don't think about as much. And so that's what I want to talk a bit about. It's it's really going to be more like we can talk about APIs and some of the, the, the pros and cons of those versus like just go through a scraping thing and stuff like that. Um, I want to see, does that sound like, seem like something you've got some, you have some thoughts on as well? Yeah, because... Incidentally, that's also the problem with the web automation, with the web testing, because essentially you're having to scrape to find the IDs to in, uh, basically to interact with the using the web driver with the pages. And one of the arguments I have, not necessarily about screen scraping, but about website design in general, is good website development requires IDs on your any input fields or any interactive action fields that you have on a page. If you're not doing that, you're essentially writing bad code. And I don't care how much AI you can put out there, you're never going to fix the problem. You have to write the code correctly or it's just not going to work. Yeah. So I think that's, and that's exactly the place. It's one of the things we want to talk about is because that's, that's part of why scraping is such a pain in the butt because most code is not written that way. Sometimes intentionally. But I think we can talk a little bit. We can dig a little bit into the whole. We can get a little nerdy on that about getting into a control and how do you how do you navigate to that and pull that information back out. So, well, hello and welcome back. We are here for another episode of Building Better Developers, also known as the Developer Podcast. Actually, I think it was it was Developer first, and then it became Building Better Developers. But it doesn't. That's like neither here nor there. I'm Rob, one of the founders of Developanor, and across the uh, the Digiverse or whatever it is, is Michael. Welcome, and I want you to introduce yourself as well. Hey, everyone. My name is Michael Malash, co-founder of Developanor and founder of Envision QA. Today, this episode, we are going to talk about, we're really, it's at a high level, we're going to talk about integration, but we're going to take a step down and talk about like really the differences between scraping versus using APIs or other methods. There are many ways that you may need to or want to ingest data into a system. And I want to talk a little bit about those because there is, and too often they sort of just, there's like a broad brush approach and either everybody thinks that you're just at the most simple of like, all we can do is import, you know, we have to have a CSV and import that and that's the only way we can get data in. Or the other end of the only way we can do this is have this really complex web scraper that goes out and crawls all these sites and grabs all this information. And then, of course, as soon as any of that information changes on the site, it's broken and we have to rewrite the code. Neither of those are 100% correct, although they might be for you. It depends on where you're at. So I think what I want to start with is the, let's start on the, the far side of that, is the challenges of scraping. And in particular, uh, this is something that's 
although it is near and dear to my heart because I've had to do this with several projects, it's maybe even nearer and dearer or however it is to Michael's because this is something that he does as part of his code generation tool. And so I think we'll start with that as like, what are the, let's start with what, let's start a little bit about what makes a good page for scraping, for getting information back off of that page from a program, programmatic sense. Not, we're not talking user experience stuff, but we're talking the backend side. So I guess one additional thing maybe you can touch on too is, you know, why, what is web scraping? Why would, why do we use it before I get into that? Because I want to oh. make sure listeners understand the difference between web scraping and interacting with APIs. All right. I will take that volley back and I'll work with that one. So scraping, I have heard people that have actually, I've come across people that think all of these things are the same. So for our purposes, we're going to talk about scraping is, and I think it's probably the technically correct way that you look at it. Scraping is when you go to either a, a it's basically go to a user interface and you from a program are trying to do the same thing a human would do. It actually comes all the way, it goes back to the old um, mainframes and they would screen scrape. What they would do is they would have something that would pull the display basically back and it would go, you know, count out 15 columns over here and three rows down and grab that value and then go six columns over here and two rows up from that and then grab that value. So it's literally like looking at your screen in that case, the grid that it was, because it was a, I think it was usually like a 40 by 25 grid. And it was like, where do you go on it to get this specific value? And then sometimes it would be, you know, you grab three blocks in a row to get a value that's a string that you know is you know three characters in length that has advanced into the web world of go to any page the easiest way to like to to get a feel for it is to go to any web page with like pretty much any browser these days right click and then hit inspect and you're going to end up getting somewhere there you're going to get an option to like pull out a javascript or a view source kind of thing and if you this is just if you don't know you know, if you don't know HTML on that, what you're going to see is you're going to see what is a essentially a formatted document. There's all of these little tags and there's these ways that you build out that page behind the scenes. So if you think of that page as all these little controls or these little widgets, however you best organize them, the goal with scraping is like, for example, if I'm going to a an input form that has first name, last name, email, phone number, and I want to go grab the phone number, then I can go look at that document format. And I know that if I go to the, you know, the email input field, I can grab that, that value off of it or vice versa. I can put a value into that field. And how you get to that is in itself a little bit of a journey because there are multiple ways to do that. There are multiple ways to tackle the, the format and how we navigate our way into those pages. But that's the scraping side. API side is, and I, I I figured I had like an example today that I think probably works the best, is that if you want to go look up information about, let's say, Michael, you can go to his website, you can go find his about page, and then you can go look for stuff that says his name, his email, phone number, all that kind of stuff. And you can go find that, and then you personally would have to go look at it, find it on the screen, and then write it down somewhere. Or if you know him enough, you could just text him something and say, hey, I need your, your phone number and your email address. And he will give you back in a way that you can easily read quickly, you know, his email and his phone. Same thing, people do that all the time with, with email. You send, somebody says, hey, I need your address. They'll give you a nice formatted little address thing. That's sort of what an, a, an API is, is that instead of you having to go look through all this stuff, you say, hey, this is the stuff I want. This is the data I want. And the API gives that back to you in a really nice format. Usually it's either, depending on how you do it, it's usually going to be JSON or XML or some different things like that, depending on what you're doing. But the, the bonus is it's well formatted and it is, it's not guesswork. If you're scraping, you're trying to figure out, is this big data even available? In an API, it is a there is a contract there of, I'm going to give you this information and you're going to give me back these fields and the data that match those. 
No, I think I got a little long winded. So sorry about that. So I'll throw you back to you, Michael, and let's see if see if you can do it and say anything in a shorter method than I just did. No, uh, that, that was really good. And thank you for doing that because I, I just wanted to make sure that we were kind of on the baseline. One other thing to kind of mention here, because if you're dealing with APIs, like Rob said, you're kind of dealing with the contract. You're dealing with a controlled way of passing data from your system to a, a requester, a user, someone trying to get information from you. Screen scraping is essentially going out to any site and just basically trying to take the data that is being displayed on a web page. And in many cases, not many companies want you to go do that uh, because they want their data to be protected, Where, which is where APIs are a little more powerful, they're a little more controlled, and you can actually put um, restrictions and security on top of them to only allow certain people access to your data. Whereas screen scraping, if it's on the web, you can get it, uh, which is where a lot of your AI tools today are out there just kind of reading a whole bunch of data from so many different pages. They're essentially scraping those pages. From a developer's perspective, if I'm building a site for screen scraping, the site needs to follow basic web page or web building techniques. Every element on your page that contains data that is necessary for consumption should have an ID, maybe a name depending upon which uh, you know, if you're using uh, JSON or whatever your tool is, but essentially ID is the universal ID. It has to be unique for all your elements on your page. You should never have two duplicate IDs. So if your developers are following best practices and building pages with IDs, then you should have no problem. You should be able to just say, hey, go read the DOM, read, pull down, basically uh, download the web page run a script to find all the IDs on the page, boom, there you go. You can go grab all the data off the page. Real simple, similar to an API, but an API, you actually make a request and you get back JSON, XML, which is very easy to parse. Um, but like I said, if you do the API and it returns XML, if you're doing a screen scrape and your page has good IDs, you essentially could do the same thing. It's essentially you're reading an XML, you're reading a DOM document, and the two could almost be identical if it's done correctly. One of the biggest problems we have, especially from a testing perspective, is not a lot of developers are building web pages with IDs in mind. They're not thinking about testers. They're not thinking about web scrapers. They're just trying to get the code out there as quickly as possible, sometimes using tools with drag and drop, which those are great, but those typically will generate a random ID for the page. Now, every time the page gets rebuilt, all those IDs change. They all randomly change. So if you're doing that, well, yeah, your page has IDs, but now, oh, next time I try to run the scraper, it all fails because none of the IDs are the same. So these are some of the problems and restrictions we have to look at when building pages. We have to think, how is this data going to be consumed? Is it just someone interacting with the web page? Is it, do I need to make sure this is tested? Do I have a more complex interface where people have to go in and actually use this, like, um, like a patient portal? or you know, an inventory management system. Those things should have IDs because one, if you're consuming data, if you're sending data back to a system to be saved, you need to have some identifier, some unique identifier. And that's how we send information back and forth so we know that, oh, hey, I got this field. This field is this data stored in this location. If you don't do that, how do you know what data you're saving? And that's... I think that gets us into the, the one of the big differences between the two when you think about it is if you, from an API, you can say, hey, I want, let's say I want customer data. I can go in, I can ask, I can say, here's a customer ID, give me the information back. And it'll say, oh, for customer ID one, here's their name, here's their address, blah, blah, blah. If you're doing the scrape, particularly if, you, if you've got these random IDs and some of these things or no IDs, then what you're doing is you're going to say, okay, I need to first find a way to get to the search page that, and then figure out how do I search for that customer. And then when I get to that customer, then I have to go find somewhere in the document, where is the name field? Where is the address field? And if I have IDs, 
then it's really just a matter of you just go find the control with that ID and you go, oh, the name, the name field is ID 46, whatever it is, and here's the value. And you can pull it out. If you don't have that, you end up having to walk the DOM, basically. So you say, well, if I go to the customer search result page and I can go to the customer detail, then I know that if I get three divs down, then I'm into the customer information. And then within that one, there's two divs over and now I'm into the address information. And within that, I can go into, there's a, you know, maybe there's an href in there so I can grab a link and then I can do that. And so you're having to like, you're having to walk the DOM just like, you know, think about indexing anything. You either can walk your way all the way through, like if you want to search for a record in a database, you can look at each record and go, is it, is it, is it, is it? Or if you have an ID, you can jump right to that row. And that's what IDs will give you. And so if you want something that is crawlable, that is scrapable, I guess they're always going to be crawlable, which let me talk about that for a second. Crawling is really just baby step scraping. Instead of getting into the details and trying to pull data out, all you're doing is going into that document and try to find anything in there that would link you to another page and then go follow that link. Now, you may say, well, that's a piece of cake. It's always an href. No, it is not. It could be an href. It could be JavaScript. It could be a whole bunch of other things. It could be, and it could be behind the scenes. It could be something where it's actually a call back to the server and the server sends something back. So there's a lot of different ways that that, that can be handled, which is why sometimes that's done on purpose so that you, instead you're driven to the API side. And then they say, hey, we're going to charge you X amount of money so you can subscribe to the API and then you can get going. If you haven't looked at these, I would, or if this is new to you, I would go look at Scrapey, S-C-R-A-P-Y. And I think it's scrapey.com. There's a Scrapey site out there that will help you like sort of walk you through stuff. Now this is through... Um, uh, yeah, so scrapey.org, and I think there's a site with it as well uh, that they have, and it may be, I forget what the other one they called, but essentially it's just like, so you can go do some scraping. It'll help you sort of drag and drop, but there's also some Python behind it so that you can actually go see what it looks like. The other thing I would do is pick just about anything. Go search for API for whatever your favorite tool is, You know, whether you're, uh, I don't know if like you use HubSpot or if you use Google, go look at the Google APIs or Amazon's APIs. There's Pretty much everybody out there, there are APIs. Some are free and some are going to be the much better way to deal with it. And then some are not because they may still be a better way to deal with it because you don't have to deal with all the headaches of that we've just talked about. But then you also have to pay them for it because they're going to say, hey, we're going to make it easier for you. We're going to make, make it nice for you. But hey, you know, share the love. And so you're going to pay us whatever you need to pay. Thoughts on those? So those were really good examples. Now there's one edge case neither of us have touched on yet, and that is embedded code or in, like iframes or essentially a page within a page. If you're trying to do scraping, that won't work if you're trying to stream the page and read the data through a stream. The only way I've gotten around this is to actually physically uh, download the complete contents of the page through like Firefox or Chrome with a plugin, uh, but only certain browsers even give you the functionality to get all that embedded code with your source code of the page when you try to export it. So that's another limitation with scraping is if you're trying to scrape pages that are actually loading data from other sites through an, like an embedded uh, plugin, you might not be able to get it. You might come into it and it's like, oh, it's not there. It can't find it. Uh, and that's just something else to think about as you're going through this. Uh, one other thing to think about, too, is if you're doing it from the testing side or even if you're doing it from a scraping side, uh, look at Selenium IDE. It's a really cool free tool. It's got plugins for just about every browser. It's got a good desktop uh, little application. And what it lets you do is it basically you open up your browser, open up Selenium, and you literally click through the page and as you click, it records what you're doing, and you can see if the elements you're working on on your page have IDs. How is Selenium seeing it is essentially going to tell you how hard is this project going to be to go scrape this page. And a bonus to that is that Selenium will allow you, you can 
export that in various languages. So if you want to scrape, if you want to have like the just a brute force scrape of data, you can actually use Selenium, have it walk through all the steps, generate that code out, and it will actually do it for you. You can just go run that in whatever your language is. It, it's got several that it does. So let's say, you know, PHP or Python or whatever, and it will, you can watch it open the browser up, walk through all of that stuff, do what it needs to do, and then, you know, close the browser, hopefully close the browser out. Otherwise, hit close browser afterwards. Um, but Selenium is awesome. Selenium really is, if you're if you're curious, if you're wondering if this is something you can do, then Selenium is one that say that is probably the, the fastest way to be able to get a page, open it, get data off of it, and, and be able to do that in a repetitive fashion. Now there are some, you know, there's some gotchas to it and things like that, but that really is like an excellent starting point for you. And that's where you're gonna see it all over the place. Anywhere that's, anybody that's dealing with scraping in particular, they're almost always gonna mention Python and they're also always gonna mention Selenium and Selenium more so, more so than anything else because that really is sort of the, the industry standard, I think for, for like robotic behavior on a web page. Final thoughts? Yeah, all I would like to say is for those of you getting into scraping, if you haven't really done scraping before, um, like Rob said, check out both the Selenium scrape, scra Scrappy, Scrapey, um, and play with them. Uh, it, it, there's Heck, go to Developer you know, throw up uh, Selenium ID or Scrapey, try to scrape our page. Some Oh, one thing we didn't touch on, though, is the other thing is some pages even offer RSS feeds, which essentially are another way to scrape a page <laughs> that we haven't really touched on. But it is yet another source. It's essentially another feeder that you can get like an API, but it's public. So you essentially hit a page. Here's all their data that you can digest. And it's in a clean manner. That's funny because as soon as you mentioned developing, I was like, oh, we forgot to mention RSS feeds. RSS feeds, just for those of you guys that anybody that has it, you probably have heard of RSS readers and such, but you can go see the source for an RSS feed and they tend to be very well, like they're, they're formatted documents. They are, it's very easy to crawl through them and get the data you need. There are, I've, I've worked with many of those over the years. Um, and use those actually as opposed to a scraper or even as opposed to an API. Because then, for example, we talked about, I think it was like a couple episodes back now, we talked about the, uh, and you guys have seen some of that if you've, if you've looked on the Python side, or actually, I'm sorry, it's the Spring Boot side, where I built the, um, I think I talked about there, anyways, built the, built the Upwork integrator little app that goes out and grabs stuff off of Upwork. Well, I do that from an RSS feed because I can then take my specific search and it allows you to crank that out as an RSS feed. And so then I can just hit that RSS feed, pull stuff down and it's limited. It's not going to give me everything. It gives me, I think, 30, 40, 50 records at a time at something, but I can hit that. I can go through everything. It's it's XML. So it's very easy to parse, it's very easy to pull out the pieces of information I want. And then I don't have to deal with an API. I don't have to connect with that. I don't have to deal with scraping. And it's pretty darn solid. I mean, RSS feeds, you tend to be pretty stable and they're just going to be out there. So if you wanted to, for example, have like, be scraping the articles that we have put out on the developer site, you can go to, and basically any WordPress, like go to the site slash RSS or RSS2, depending on how it is. And then you can see a nice XML document that you can, parse and do what you, you know, do whatever you want to with it, other than obviously repurpose it unless you tell us. And then, then we're cool about that. That being said, I think we're going to wrap this one up. So as always, shoot us an email at info at developpreneur.com. If you have any questions, if you have suggestions, if you have anything like that, any feedback, we'd love to hear it. You can check us out on YouTube at developpreneur and just go out there and have yourself a great day, a great week. And we will talk to you next time. All right. Thoughts? That seemed to go pretty well, too, I thought. Yeah, no, I like that. In fact, it gave me an idea, and I'm going to throw it out here. So when I'm listening to this again, I'll remember to do it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw the links out there for uh, Scrapey, um, kind of like RSS. Well, yeah. There, yeah. There's a plug-in for that. 
uh, one for Selenium IDE. And then what I may even do is I may even throw out a, a simple Python script to just uh, screen scrape a page. Yeah. Yeah, if you need that, I've got like a thousand of those so far. <laughs> so we do that. I mean, we really, we we do that so often. It's 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 sort of funny as it's now it's become just a standard. Well, that's that's what the guy I was talking to today, it's a new customer. And he's like, hey, can we, you know, he wants some data. And it's like, can we do that? It's like, yeah, people do that all the time. Literally, like we have done that for all kinds of different verticals. And yeah, it's just, we'll go grab it. And yeah, it's not, if you're scraping it, that's the only thing is it's not a hundred percent. It's like, you'll get some weird stuff. Even we didn't even get into this. We had something where we were, it was, you pull down a PDF and mm -hmm. you would think pull down a PDF like XML or CSV or anything else. Like just pull it down, scrape it and you're good. PDFs, even it was amazing. It was obviously the same uh, generation engine. It was a report. It was a nice little PDF report that we were trying to find the data on. And it was it would periodically it would just be totally off. Mm. It was just we could we finally got I think we got it to like better than ninety eight percent hit rate, but it would be stuff where it was just like it's like nope it's they added another column there and it's <laughs> like there shouldn't be but they just add another column there and it would be because of uh, for example like if somebody put extra spaces somewhere it would just decide that nope that's now another field that's another column and you really couldn't see it. In the like, if you looked at the PDF, it looked fine. You had to actually look at the the document behind the scenes. You had to look at the DOM for that PDF to realize that oh, they actually you know threw another column in there that's empty that has no value. But that's kind of crap that we you know that you can run into. Yet another play, way that you can get into scraping and integrating data and stuff like that. We've, we've done it all. It feels like the last few years. And it's, it's I did that one, what, uh, over a decade ago, uh, back when, uh, almost American on patient days, but, uh, there was a guy, uh, there was a site out there for a while that had all the old, uh, tabletop documents for like old school Dungeons and Dragons battle tech, uh, Mac warrior like hmm. all the old stuff that you can't get anymore that's all discontinued and he had it all online all basically it was kind of like a um dropbox but this was kind of before dropbox was really popular and I, I just wrote a little scraper that went out literally and it found all the links and it downloaded all the documents in the same st file structure and i was able to uh kind of parse through and find the ones I was looking for, but I, I couldn't find them through the site. So I was like, well, here, I'll just get them all and I'll figure it out later. And uh, yeah, those are things you can do with these scrapers. It's not just scraping data, but you can actually download files. You can interact with things. You can pull in videos. You can pull in images. Uh, you know, lots of things you can do with it. I actually did that. And this is bonus material, so there you go. Um, I had a customer that we built, well, I built out a site for her, and we had, I don't know, 20, 30 different pages and screens. And at the end of the day, she wanted to have a, a picture, she wanted a screenshot of every single screen as part of the, the user documentation. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's gonna take a while. But what I ended up doing is a screen scraper that just walked through everything. And it was easy enough because I knew all the links. I just I, did, I just crawled the site initially and said, boom, take a, every, just go to each page, snap a picture, go to a page, snap a picture. And I think I had like three others that was like, yeah, I just went in and manually then just said, added those couple of links and said, go there and snap it. And then suddenly had, you know, whatever it was, the 40 or 50 images that she needed. Simple things like that. It's like, you, you, it's not till you think about it and you're like, oh, wait. You sneeze and then you go, hey, that's actually a better way to do it than to manually go through it. It's just one of those things, once you've done it a couple of times, you look at some of these things and it's like, ah, I really don't want to do that a hundred times, but it would be, maybe I can spend a few minutes, especially with some of these tools, I can spend a little bit, generate something that I can just replicate over and over again and have it do the work for me instead of me doing the, you know, going through that drudgery. Now it's funny uh, that you mentioned that because on the testing side of things, uh, what you can do, especially with the Selenium web driver, is you can walk through a sitemap and you can actually uh, use screenshot through web driver and it will take, so like if, if you want to do a screenshot in Chrome or Firefox, you essentially load the driver for that browser 
and then do a, a snapshot of the page that you're on. So if you're actually doing like uh, browser comparisons to see how does your site look on each browser, uh, what you can do is you do that. And then what you do is you do a image compare and it will tell you, oh, hey, this image does not match these. And it, it it's kind of cool. It, very simple. There's good examples out there for that. But that's just another way that you can uh, do that with some online tools. That's a neat one we did that's like a little bit... I'll say it's a, what they what this customer is doing was a little bit shady, but it's legal, but it's a little bit like it's it's borderline stuff. And that was one of the other things they did is this was um as a scraper is an automation tool, and it was very sensitive to certain themes and some things like that. And so what they did is they had a they had uh, a crawler go through and it would just walk through this and take the picture of each of the themes. So then later they could go and say, am I on this page? And they could actually completely compare that image as opposed to, you know, trying to look for other stuff because they would, they would look for, I guess, certain tags and those would change, things would move, the formats would change. So instead it looked the same, basically. It was enough that they'd say, okay, if this is a, you know, 80% match, then we're basically on the right page. If it's not, then we're you know on the wrong page, and they would do that with like they did that even they went and grabbed uh, they do buttons. So instead of trying to find the button control, they would go see if that image existed somewhere in the the mapping, and then they would go use that so they could figure out what the coordinates were, so they could press the button that way. I mean, there's some there's some stuff like that, and it's like because at first I was like, why do you have eighteen pictures of the same button? And they're all just a little bit different. And it turned out it has to do with, um, it was the way they were spinning stuff up and it had to do with the display resolution and then also some of the, the default color themes that would show up. And so, so yeah, it's it's funny, that kind of stuff that you you don't think about. Like, why would you need to like take pictures as you're walking through a site? But there are a lot of uses for such things. Well, and it's even interesting now too, the last thing you mentioned there where they were taking the pictures and you know to see what was there. Well, now, like uh, Amazon has, it's not Poly, but they've got one of their libraries now where you can uh, basically look for text on an image and then scrape the text from the image as well. So not only can you, you know, scrape web pages, but you can also scrape images on a page as well. That's true. That's one that I've seen some of it in the late, in recent years. I don't know how well that works, but I've seen a couple of people, that, a couple of places that use it. It seems to work for them pretty well. And it probably is. Um, I, yeah, same thing. Polly, I think, is the speech to text, but there, it's something like that. There is. I was amazed at um, some of the image processing stuff, and this was, gosh, just like three or four years ago when I was going through all of the Amazon services. They had just opened a couple of those up, and it was built for. Uh, really, it was built initially for augmented and virtual reality stuff, but it was saying so. Like I could take a picture, and I would. It would. You'd have a series of pictures, and you say, "Show me the parrots." And it would go find the parrots in each of those. And you would, it would, it's not a picture of a parrot. It would just like, I want, show me parrot. And it would pull those out. And so things like that, it's just, it's amazing the image processing stuff that they can do and how well they can actually search those now. And that will probably end up being the next, you know, round of scraping is like, hey, I want to, you know, grab some of the text off of these images. Well, the thing uh, Apple's got, I think Google does too. I know we're getting a little long here, but. Uh, you can also translate text. So I've actually been watching some shows and it's like, oh, what's that say? And I take a picture of it and then I highlight the text and I say translate and it'll translate it. It works for most languages, um, but it's, I mean, it's amazing where we're going with technology. Well, that was, I got introduced to that, gosh, now it's probably 10, 15 years ago because I Google Translate was like, you can slap that on an, on any web page. And there was something I was doing for somebody, I don't remember who the customer was, but they wanted it, they needed it in like six different languages. Like, I don't know six different languages. I mean, programming language is great, but spoken languages, no. I, I don't know if I can do this. And they were, we're talking through some stuff and they were like gonna go hire some people and rewrite, you know, just extract everything out into strings and then convert, you know, convert all of it and translate it all. And I, I ended up, playing around with the Google Translate and you just put a little button there and it'll just like, you just like tell it what language and boom, it'll give you that language. It was two lines of code and it wasn't perfect because it's just, it was a, you know, just brute force translation, but it was close enough for the languages they were using. They're like, yeah, that works what we need. You know, that's what we need. And then, you know, we said, okay, if you've got a language that you need it, you really want it 
and it doesn't translate, then we can always go back and we can create that specific page for that language. There's some things we can do, but you know, stuff like that, that gets you said 80, 20 rule. If it can get you 80% of there or better, then why not? I mean, let's say like some of that stuff, it's, it's almost free to use it or it is. So why not just take that? Exactly. All right. I think we can call it a wrap. We got a couple episodes done. We'll come back next week. We'll do it on Thursday. And uh, let's keep chugging along. Sounds good. Thanks again, Rob, for moving around and dealing with the weather and that. Um, we're supposed to get the really bad storms tomorrow. So uh, I didn't think I wanted to take a chance to lose an internet during that. That's a good point. And that's, yeah, it's sort of frustrating when we do. So the rest of you guys, goodbye. Have a good one. And yourself, we'll talk to you again next time. And uh, we'll just keep chugging along. And I'm sure we'll have plenty to rant about next week as well.